Okay, we'll start with this. Well, Deontay Wilder had this to say. I'm a network free agent. I can fight anyone, anywhere. He was quoted as saying, of course, it's always where the money is that make the fight. Dismissing any such platform limitations. I'm a network free agent. I can fight anyone. I just don't have to necessarily fight on the networks that I'm on. I can fight anywhere. That's what's so great about me. Fury signing with ESPN BT Sport don't really affect me. If he wants the rematch, then he's going to fight. If not, then we move on to the next one. We have enough guys in the PBC stable that we can fight for the next two years. The great thing is, I can maneuver around and do whatever I want. The rematch is still on the table for him. If he wants it, he wants it. If not, then may God be with him. Now let me tell you something. In theory, Deontay Wilde is right. In theory. He has no such agreements, no such exclusivity contracts that pin him down to fighting on one particular network. He really doesn't. That bit of it is true. But I'll tell you something, the same is true for a lot of PBC fighters. The same is true for a lot of guys. A lot of guys like Errol Spence, a lot of guys like Mikey Garcia. These are not fighters that have exclusivity contracts, existing exclusivity contracts that force them to fight on a particular network. And yet, whenever one of these guys is required to cross the street for a fight, that is met with resistance. Suddenly, that becomes an obstacle, lest we forget. It was Errol Spence himself that said, I fight on Showtime and Fox. If Terrence Crawford want to fight, he's got to cross the street. Y'all forgot? And Errol Spence, much like Deontay Wilder, he doesn't have an exclusivity contract with any particular network, but he acts like he does. They all do. I mean, PBC's recent deal with Fox, in case you guys forgot, PBC's recent deal with Fox was contingent that they get the Mikey Garcia versus Errol Spence fight. So while there might not be an exclusivity contract in play, it does appear that PBC's fighters are preferential to fighting on certain networks. Networks, whether there's an exclusivity contract or not. In which case, while Deontay Wilder might be sitting here saying that he can fight on any network, you don't fight on any network. You fight on a particular network, the network that you've been fighting on. So even if you are a quote-unquote network free agent, it doesn't seem to mean much. It really doesn't. I know that there are people out there that want to feel like the door is still open for a Deontay Wilder versus Tyson Fury rematch. I know that there are people out there that are telling themselves that, you know what, yeah, Deontay don't got a contract with Showtime, so he can fight on another network. In theory, that's true. In theory. But ask yourselves a question. How much do you think the people over there at the PBC want to see Deontay Wilder fighting on ESPN? How much do you think they want to see that? <laughs> How much do you think they want to see Top Rank at the helm of promotions in a fight that involves Deontay Wilder? Do you think that the people over there at the PBC really want to see that? Ask yourself that question. I mean, it all sounds good. It all sounds fantastic. That, oh, I, you know, the beauty of me is I can go anywhere, but wh where do you go? Wh where do you go? So you'll excuse me for saying that... The same issues that I addressed in my previous video are the same issues that exist today. The people over there at the PBC don't want to have to see Deontay Wilder cross the street and, and fight on ESPN on a top rank card. But in order for a Fury fight to come off, that is a possibility. So you have to ask yourself, how much does the PBC really want Deontay Wilder to fight Tyson Fury now? Now that the situation has changed. I mean, maybe to Deontay Wilder, the fighter, maybe to him. A Tyson Fury rematch is still a priority. But to the bigwigs over there at the PBC, to the higher-ups, they know that now that rematch spells trouble. It spells trouble in more ways than one. And it's for that reason that the rematch itself might suddenly become an unappealing option. Now, uh, Bob Arum, he chimed in and he had this to say. He said, we don't need the WBC to dictate Wilder or Fury's rematch purses. He was quoted as saying, the purse bid doesn't factor into it at all. Aram told BoxingScene.com. The WBC wants the fight to happen. Good luck to them. But we don't need them to tell us how the purses should be. That'll come with reasonable negotiations. Aram also emphasized that an immediate rematch of their dubious draw December 1st in Los Angeles doesn't necessarily need to take place on May 18th. A deal was nearly finalized last week for Fury and Wilder to fight again for Wilder's WBC heavyweight championship May 18th at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Well, there's no magic in May 18th, Aram said. That's just one day of the year. When it comes time to pick a date for the fight, as long as the fight happens, what difference does it make if it's in June or where it is? I mean, obviously Las Vegas would be a good place for it, and there are other good places for it. But I mean, that's to be decided 
when the time comes. Now here we see even more red flags, even more indicators that Deontay Wilde and Tyson Fury might not be fighting each other next. And the reason I say this is because you'll notice what Bob Arum is saying. You'll notice that he's minimizing the importance of the WBC in all of this. The WBC that basically put a time constraint for Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury to reach a deal. They put a time constraint on that. And Aram is dismissing that time constraint and he's dismissing them all together. As if to say that we could decide to fight somebody else next. What are they gonna do about it? We, we could decide to fight Deontay Wilder at a later date. What are they gonna do about it? That's basically what the man is saying, you understand. That where the WBC might want a deal reached in a timely fashion so that the fight can come off on May 18th, for example, what Bob is saying, well, it don't have to happen on May 18th. It could happen in June. In that way, you can hypothesize, speculate, that whatever plans the people over there at Top Rank and ESPN have for Tyson Fury, maybe they don't include Deontay Wilder, at least not in the immediate future. Wow. Ask yourself a question. Would Tyson Fury and Frank Warren have made clandestine attempts that even Wilder and his team weren't aware of? Would they have made clandestine attempts to iron out a deal with Top Rank and ESPN if Deontay Wilder were the priority? I mean, they'd have to realize, while they're doing this, they would have to realize that in striking a deal with Top Rank, you're jeopardizing a fight with Wilder. Yet they chose to go ahead and do this anyway, behind the scenes. And Wilder and his team knew nothing about it. In that way, you can kind of see that maybe whatever plans they got for Tyson Fury in the near future, in the next one or two fights, maybe they don't even include Deontay Wilder because he's already reaped the benefit of fighting Deontay Wilder. There are a lot of people out there right now they're saying that Tyson Fury won that fight, in spite of how the judges scored it. There are still a lot of people out there that feel like Tyson Fury won. And in that way, he's already reaping the benefit. He's kind of like the king without a crown. So do the people over there at Queensbury Promotions, the people over there at Top Rank Promotions, and the people over there at ESPN. They may be looking at Tyson Fury as a hot commodity in spite of the draw. And they may be telling themselves, look, we didn't iron out this deal with you for you to go over there and take a chance on Deontay Wilder again. We've got a plan. We've got a plan for you. And we've got a lot of money to pay you if you follow that plan. So ladies and germs, I'm not convinced at all that these guys are going to fight. At least not next. It doesn't look that way. And all the signs are there. All the red flags are there. You just have to pay close attention to what's being said. Here's an example. Wilder still targets a May 18th return. Fury remains primary goal. Sounds good enough. Here Wilder was quoted as saying, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. At the end of the day, we put ourselves in a position that we feel is going to enhance our career. That's what it's all about. Putting yourself in position, your family into position, where it benefits you and your career. Now, this is where you got to pay close attention. Wilder was quoted as saying, Look, I plan to still fight in May. If it's not Fury, we can fight that bitch-ass Dominic Brazil. We can fight that Polish kid, Adam Kalnaki. Or we can fight England's Dillian White. It don't matter to me. We're still fighting in May. It could be the 18th. That hasn't changed. Whether it's against Brazil, we're still fighting on that date. We're in control of our career. We still have that date. It could be Brazil. It could be Kalnaki. You got Andy Ruiz. He just came to the PBC stable. Ortiz still over there. We got plenty of options. The rematch is still on the table for him if he wants it. He wants it. If not, then may God be with him. It's a draw. Nobody won and nobody lost. With me and my mentality as a champion, I want to see a winner and a loser. I don't want to see no draw. With Fury, I guess he feels. He's gotten the response of the people that he won the fight. That's how he feel, and I can feel the same way. Each and every day, all I've been getting is how I knocked him out. The highlight for him is how he got back up. So, understand something, ladies and gents. Right now, Deontay Wilder is mulling over options, mulling over alternatives, because in the back of his mind, he knows that this Fury fight may not come off, that this Fury rematch might not happen, at least not next, in which case, he's looking at what other options are out there for him. Coincidentally, these are the aforementioned options that I mentioned in my video. The last one. In my previous video that, you know what? Dominic Brazil's over there, Adam Kalnaki's over there, Andy Ruiz just got there, and if all else fails, he can always have a Luis Ortiz rematch. But the bottom line is, this move from Tyson Fury, it does jeopardize how likely a rematch is to happen now that the situation has changed. Now, I'll allude to my previous point, that in theory, Deontay Wilder might just be a, a network free agent, in theory. I mean, for all intents and purposes, that's what he is, right? He's got no exclusivity contract with either Showtime or Fox. So, in theory, he is a network-free agent. 
But if he were so confident, his handlers were so confident, and the fans were so confident that Wilder's a free agent, he can fight on any network, then why is everybody upset? Why is everybody now saying that the fight is in jeopardy? Why is there all this hubbub going on if Wilder is, in fact, a network free agent? That's what he is, right? Or, let me rephrase that. If Wilder's a network free agent, then why should it even matter if Tyson Fury struck a deal with Top Rank and ESPN? I mean, if you're a network free agent, all that means is that you'd have to meet him on his side of the street to have the rematch. But for a network free agent, that really shouldn't even be a problem. A lot of PBC fighters will tell you they don't have a promoter, they don't need a promoter, they're network free agents, what have you. A lot of these guys kick that same spiel. But at the end of the day, we know that these kinds of situations are the obstacles that end up in fights being blocked. End up in fights not happening. So Wilder can sit there and say that shit all day till he blew in the face. But you and I know that this fight is in jeopardy. You and I know that there's a chance, a good chance, that Tyson Fury don't fight him next, if at all. Tyson Fury didn't cross that street and jeopardize this fight because Wilder's a priority. Let's just use our common sense. Let's put our thinking caps on here. They were fully aware what it could mean if they strike a deal with top rank and ESPN. And that's why they did this in secret behind Wilder's back and his team. Wilder's team had no idea that this was going on, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason that for the past couple of weeks, these guys have been in deep negotiations to iron out the details for a rematch, and yet, Team Wilder was kept completely in the dark as far as Tyson Fury's potential U.S. broadcasting deal. There's a reason for that, and the reason is they know what it would mean. They know how it would be perceived. They know what obstacles could be presented if Tyson Fury actually gets that deal. And guess what? He got that deal. And here we are today, and the fight is in jeopardy. Ladies and gentlemen, don't lie to yourselves. Don't do it. I told you before, the Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder pay-per-view. It was a mild success, and it was. It's a wonder that nobody lost any money, because if they had, then it would have been a complete flop. So in that way, it's good that they got to make a little bit of change. But don't overstate the value, the monetary value, the overall revenue generated from that fight. Because if that fight made a killing the way that some people want you to believe it made a killing, then that would be Tyson Fury's priority, not striking a deal with Top Rank to fight on ESPN. Moving on. I wanted to talk about a story that I saw a few days ago, but I didn't get the chance to chime in. Been a little bit busy. But I wanted to talk about the viewership numbers for the Rob Brandt versus Kassan Besangarov fight. They're back. And these guys did close to a million views. That's very good for Rob Brandt. And here's why. Rob Brandt does not have the profile of a Demetrius Andre, nope. of a Daniel Jacobs, of a Billy Joe Saunders, or even a Jamal Charlo. Nope. He doesn't have the profile of those guys, let alone the bigger names, like the Golovkins and the Canellos. And yet, almost a million people saw him fight. Saw him fight a guy that has virtually no profile in the United States. Kassan Besangara. Basil what now? Now this is a byproduct of Brent's relationship with Top Rank slash ESPN. That, you know, since you're a Top Rank fighter, you get to fight on ESPN. Thus, you have access to that many more homes and they have access to you and your fights. It's synergy. It's very good. And the reason you can... Deduce that. Hypothesize that it's very good. The reason that you can look at these numbers and say that that's very encouraging is because comparatively, a more popular fighter fought not that long ago. A more popular fighter by the name of Gervonta Davis. A fighter who's more talked about. He's in the news more often than not. I mean, this is a guy that comes up in any variety of discussions. So for all intents and purposes, based on how much people talk about Gervonta Davis, you would think that he has the better profile. And yet, Rob Brent's putting up better numbers than he is. Look at the numbers for the Javante Davis versus Hugo Ruiz fight. 429,000 views. Those numbers are abysmal. Given how Leonard Ellerbe and Floyd Mayweather talk about Javante Davis, they say he's a star. At least they want you to believe that. Are these the kinds of numbers that a star puts up when he's got a fight coming up? No. Nope. When, he, when he only fought once last year. I mean, if this guy's a star, then people should be clawing at their faces to see him next fight. And yet, this is what he put up. These are his numbers. 429,000 or something like that. Comparatively... With Brant. About 300,000 more people were interested in seeing Rob Brant fight than they were to see Javante Davis fight. And yet, Javante Davis is the one with, supposedly, the better profile. Now, this heralds two things. Two things in particular that I want to discuss. One, the jig is up 
for Javante Davis. And people are fed up with it. They are no longer interested in him. And we are seeing the byproduct of that. That while we might sit here and talk about this guy and all the different shit going on with his career, at the end of the day, that's not making a big enough impact that people are interested in seeing him fight the likes of a Hugo Ruiz. They don't care. Layman's terms, the way that Javante Davis' career is being handled is starting to backfire, and he's suffering for it. That's the first thing. And the second thing that it heralds is, this may be the beginning of the end for Showtime, at least in relation to broadcasting boxing, because these numbers are terrible numbers. They're abysmal. They really are. The big wigs over at Showtime have got to be looking at this and scratching their heads, thinking to themselves, well, what's the point in airing these cards when this is all we're going to draw in? This is all we can do by airing these PBC cards with these PBC fighters. What is the point? You know, our viewership last year wasn't very impressive at all, and this year... It's worse. It's even less impressive. Then you factor in everything that's going on between Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury. You know, the fact that, well, that fight might not happen now, and if it does, it might not even be on Showtime. They've got to be looking at this and thinking to themselves, you know, we might have to pull out of the sport of boxing. You know, because it, it's not doing anything for our network. It's not doing anything for us. When 429,000 people are all you can bring us on a Saturday night, I can hardly imagine that Showtime's subscribers are subscribing to see fighters like Javante Davis. I mean, I realize that Showtime is a premium cable network, that it doesn't reach as many homes as an ESPN or a Fox. I, I'm fully aware of that, but at the end of the day, even Showtime has millions of subscribers. access to millions of homes, millions upon millions of homes, and yet, you guys weren't able to draw in at least a million or anything close to it with Javante Davis. This guy that Leonard Ellerby and Floyd Mayweather want you to believe is some kind of a star. Well, it's not showing up in the numbers. Men lie, women lie, and numbers don't. And it's not showing up in the numbers that Javante Davis is any kind of a star. Now, you can deduce that maybe if that whole thing with Abner Mahrez hadn't happened, you know, his retina being detached, having to pull out because of his eye, what have you. Maybe he, with, with the help of Abner, they could have got Abner's fans to compensate for some of that viewership. Because Abner's very popular in that region of the country, maybe more homes would have tuned in to see that fight. But it is what it is. This is what happened. So the woulda, coulda, shoulda doesn't even matter. I'll tell you that that's why I think, at least that's a part of the reason I think, that Tyson Fury made the move that he made so that he could be in bed with ESPN. Because look at Rob Brandt's numbers and compare them to Javante Davis's numbers. And the writing is on the wall right then and there. So ladies and germs, not only is the jig up for Javante Davis, and it's shown in the numbers, but Showtime, they can't continually put on cards and only garner this abysmal level of viewership. If it continues, we can expect them to be out of the sport of boxing in a few years.